September 8th through September 15th of 2013, found a group of 27 from Michigan Farm Bureau, Greenstone Farm Credit Services, farmers, and agribusiness people on an agricultural study tour of Ukraine. It's been said that to understand life in Ukraine today, you first have to understand their history. The country has been fought over for thousands of years. Most recently, the end of the First World War saw them fall to the Soviet Union. Under the reign of Joseph Stalin, many farmers were forced from their villages into collective farms to raise grain for the state, giving up their private land, livestock, and equipment without compensation. Stalin took it a step further and withheld grain to the collectives if quotas weren't reached. Today, it's estimated that up to 6 million perished between 1932 and 1933, accounting for 25% of the entire population. World War II saw Ukraine invaded by Nazi Germany in 1941, with estimates of over 7 million perishing. In the 50 years that followed, Ukraine remained under the stronghold of the Soviet Union. But on August 24, 1991, they declared their independence. 22 years later, they honor their past and those who sacrificed with statues and relics from their darkest days. Among them are symbols of hope and strength, such as Mother of the Motherland. Today, Ukraine is a country of 42 million people and 130 nationalities. Its national government is located in Kiev, population 2.8 million, and the eighth largest city in Europe. The average family has one child with an average income of $440 U.S. a month, and they spend roughly 40% of their income on food. Located on the Dnieper River, Soviet-style apartments dot the landscape, with most residents being renters. Russian-made automobiles travel roadways in dire need of repair. Many utilize the subway system built in 1960 known as Kiev Metro, making their way to and from industrial, high-tech, and government jobs. Unemployment is roughly 35%, with most occurring in rural areas. Citizens are taxed at a rate of 37%, provide a national health care and schooling, though no government safety net exists for those in need. There are 34,000 churches and registered religious organizations in Ukraine. Of the estimated 40% practicing religion in the country, 97% are Christian, with 70% of those being Ukrainian Orthodox. Ukrainians are, if anything, a people well aware of their past, seemingly untrusting at first, but won over in time with honesty and kindness. The current generation seems to be motivated with a want to succeed. The older generation can be of the communist socialist mindset, still waiting and wanting for someone to tell them what to do. Ukraine, at 233,000 square miles, is roughly two and a half times the size of Michigan, with 79 million acres being arable land. They're a major world producer and exporter of grains and oil seeds, ranking in the top five in production. They're the number three producer of sunflower oil in the world, and their country is home to one-third of the most fertile soils globally. 32% of the population is rural, with 17% involved in agriculture. Farmers, along with everyone else in the country, cannot own land, for it's held by the government. Instead, it's leased for periods of up to 50 years. 70% of the farmers are of the small village variety, to the tune of 14 million, the babushkas or grandparents' farm, growing crops on an acre of land, maybe grazing a milk cow or two, and selling their goods at a local farm market. 30% are registered companies, many with investors from outside Ukraine, leasing anywhere from 12,500 to 132,000 acres. Agricor Holding is located in the Chernigov region. They lease 100,000 acres of land, growing a variety of grain and oilseed crops, along with raising 3,300 hogs, 2,000 dairy cattle, and 6,200 head of beef cattle. The group stopped to hear from two of Agricor's 1,000 employees, in particular about their beef herd, which included 330 red Semmental cattle imported from France in 2011. They're pastured on natural grassland from May to November and then stabled. They're bred at 18 months of age, weaned at six months, and then finished at a feedlot for 420 days. Working with Pfizer on a vaccination program, Agricor is talking with McDonald's about supplying their needs for beef and their Ukrainian restaurants. 
the Ukrainian uh, beef cow calf operation is very similar to what we uh, do back um, in the United States and especially in Michigan, uh, taking advantage of a lot of pasture ground that isn't suitable for row crop farming. And that's exactly what these guys are doing here. They do have a cattle health program. Um, they do have a mandatory identification program. They had Bengal tags and all the cows and bulls with individual numbers on them that they had to report. Um, and they also talked about their negotiations right now um, for possibly contracting with McDonald's. And I think is one of the things that if they do get into that program with McDonald's, they're gonna have to have some sort of a mandatory health protocol and um, probably look at a genetic standard for the quality of meat that they would be um, delivering for that food system. With the mission to replicate the agriculture of the American Midwest and Central Ukraine, the Kiev Atlantic Ukraine Corporation in Miranivka is a prosperous grain processing enterprise centered on a feed mill that serves the needs of the nation's massive population of household subsistence farmers, those who produce little more than what it takes to feed their own family. Up to 200 area farmers contract with the company to raise and supply feed commodities, including corn, wheat, barley, soybeans, sunflowers, and alfalfa hay. Kiev Atlantic takes in grain 24 hours a day, seven days a week from October through January, then stays busy March through August, drying, cleaning, grinding, and combining those raw ingredients into dozens of formulas for animal feed, custom blended for everything from rabbits and chickens to goats and piglets. Started in 1994 by American David Sweary, the company also has Danish and Ukrainian investors. Their staff of 50 employees work 12-hour shifts at the facility, which is part of a larger, vertically integrated enterprise. Kiev Atlantic Ukraine farms 25,000 acres of grain, processing almost all of it. They have 85 of their own stores across the country selling their commodities, and they raise some livestock as well. In uh, July 1990, the Spirit family was invited uh, by Agrarian uh, Academy to visit Ukraine. Uh, they came here and understood that uh, Ukraine is really a potential country. And for that time, Ukraine didn't have uh, protein at all. Uh, they decided to grow soybeans, and they were the first uh, farmers who uh, grew and uh, processed uh, soybeans. Farming equipment to plant and harvest the vast fields in Ukraine varies in age, size, and color. There's an ever-increasing presence of John Deere, thanks to the likes of Rise Euclid Farming. They're one of the country's largest John Deere service providers. Located just south of Bila Cirkva, this facility services many brands of farm implements, although parts for older equipment routinely takes weeks to acquire if they're available at all. The 800 series tractors are the most popular, there are five John Deere training centers and dealerships in Ukraine. Another company is Germany-based manufacturer Ropa, which operates a diverse agribusiness near the town of Mankivka. Central to the implement sales and service side of the business are the company's self-propelled sugar beet harvesters. Ropa also leases land from local farmers and grows a variety of crops. But one they didn't grow this year due to poor prices was sugar beets. Nonetheless, Ropa technicians were busy with servicing several machines during the visit. It's a real eye-opener coming over here. I mean, we think about a big field in Michigan as 100 acres, and we're seeing fields that are 3,000 acres in our uh, math. And it, it was amazing that they can take like this little tractor and do that amount of work. And then if something breaks, it's not as easy as running a half hour, 40 minutes to go get a part that you may have to wait one day to get it from a dealer where they have to wait several months. And it just, it's, it's really their infrastructure and their roads. You can see that they gotta be patient. And I think it, we, we need to learn some of that too is it could be a lot worse. Agro-industrial enterprises is a model of agricultural entrepreneurship in Ukraine, though an anomaly. Kaplan Nikolay is the director general of the corporation and from what we could gather, the sole owner of the 22,000 acre operation. With no agricultural education, he's raising both livestock and crops. He owns all of his own equipment and buildings, including a sugar beet plant and a dairy. 
His milk is collected, shipped and processed by Milky Land Milk Company, a major processor in Ukraine. Soybeans are being harvested and delivered to his barns while there. He grows varieties from both Canada and Ohio State, harvesting them with combines from his fleet of 13, made up of John Deere, Kloss, and Case. Said to be the mayor of his village, Mr. Nikolay has shared much of the prosperity he's found since Ukraine's independence with the local communities that are home to many of his 450 employees. Among his proudest accomplishments is the restoration of a Ukrainian Orthodox church founded more than 1,000 years ago. Ukrainian Milk Company is the nation's largest dairy farm, with 7,200 German Holsteins in all, 3,500 cows, milking 1,600 of them. Built in 2006, the $52 million investment came from three private investors. They're feeding their livestock with crops from the 25,000 acres of fertile land it leases. They feed corn silage, dried roasted soybeans, sunflower silage, and a barley wheat mixture. They have a lab on site to sample feed and balance rations, along with a staff of seven veterinarians as well. Their buildings are constructed of steel, aluminum, and cement. Law forbids them from using wood to prevent fire risk. All the manure is used in their biogas system for power generation, which can produce 510 kilowatts per hour. Dairy operations like Ukrainian milk account for 500,000 of the 2.5 million cows in Ukraine. The rest are held by private households, the villagers. Ukrainians drink roughly half the milk or less than what Americans consume, but efforts similar to the Got Milk campaign are underway to hopefully increase the awareness of the nutritional value. Their National Dairy Association, uh, you know, it definitely appears though they're, they're trying to go down the right path, but uh, they've got a long ways to go as far as um, having control over the majority of the milk right now. It appears as though a lot of it is uh, marketed individually to small processors uh, at random. They're trying to pool it and uh, work collectively a little more, but they've got, a, they've got some challenges in getting that done. Another contributor to Ukraine's milk supply is Elita Limited. Owned by a German family who came to Ukraine, they currently milk 750 Holsteins, with plans to expand to 2,200 in the near future. When that happens, they will move from human to robotic milkers, for though labor is cheap, they can't find enough willing to work long hours and who will pay proper attention to the animals. I was really expecting to see more of the um, small household type farms, which we did see some of those, and I was really surprised by the larger farms, how similar they are to the farms that we have in the United States. Um, with the quality, with the management practices, when they get into talking about the reproduction practices that they're using, that they're using OBSINC programs, some of the same programs that we're using in the United States, I was surprised by. Um, I think it's great to see how far they've come so far, and it'll be interesting to see the other changes they have to go through, or that they do go through. Elita also has a small swine facility with two to three hundred sows. Along with owning the buildings and equipment, they raise their own feed. Their animals are just a few of the eight million hogs raised in Ukraine, half on enterprises and half on household farms. Along with livestock and grain crops, vegetables are major commodities in Ukraine. Many are grown and sold by villagers on the side of roads and highways at small farm markets. Onions, tomatoes, garlic, peppers and melons were plentiful in early September. Along with the village grower is Uman Greenhouses. With 87 acres under glass, they operate three huge facilities in as many Ukrainian cities, growing 20 varieties of tomatoes, cucumbers and other vegetables. This facility was built in 1973, the third largest greenhouse in Ukraine. It produces 20,000 tons of vegetables annually, two-thirds for the domestic market and another third for export to Russia. Well, one thing I learned is that they, even in the packing facility, they, they use more human labor rather than, than mechanized equipment. Also, the, um, with spraying, it seems like most of them didn't spray. He wasn't even sure if they sprayed their tomatoes. Uh, he wasn't, you know, wasn't 100 percent sure, but that, that, that was a little, uh, a little different. I'm getting, you know, they must do something with that. Also, uh, uh, a lot of the smaller farms obviously didn't, didn't spray, and uh, even at the uh, tomato, pro tomato processing plant. 
they had a lot of disease problems in there that they weren't taken care of. The word Chumak in Ukrainian means traveling merchant. In 1996, two young Swedish entrepreneurs moved to Ukraine with the goal of processing vegetables. Thanks to a business deal with Ukraine's state property fund, which allows for the transfer of state property to private ownership, today their multi-million dollar enterprise, called Chumak Company, is processing up to 2,000 tons of fresh tomatoes daily. They're cooked down into tomato paste, which they in turn use to make a variety of sauces and ketchup. They also process sunflowers into oil, which is used to make mayonnaise. Their cucumbers are processed for a contract with McDonald's in supplying their need for pickles. And most recently, they ventured into making and packaging pasta as well. In all, they have over 80 different products. Chumak leases no land for growing. Instead, they contract with other growers and also allow non-contracted farmers to bring in their harvest. It all fits with their company slogan, from field to table. If you ask almost anyone in Ukraine who the major player is in agriculture, undoubtedly the answer is agro-holding. Who they are is somewhat of a mystery, but the numbers are staggering. It's said they have leases on 1.6 million acres of land across the country. One part of their monopoly is the Pidgurieski fruit ranch in central Ukraine. The apple, stone fruit, and cereal grains farm encompasses 1,800 acres leased from the state and 80 more leased from a nearby village. Its primary focus is apples with trestled dwarf trees laden with Fuji, Golden, Jana Gold, and a pair of big selling Ukrainian varieties, Simarenko and Florina. The operation employs 120 and boasts a storage capacity of 500 tons. They work with DuPont Chemical on trials. They're allowed to use organophosphates before blossom to help with disease, but it's illegal to do so after. One of their biggest challenges is labor during the harvest. Young people are unwilling to do the work, so they rely on the older villagers who are understandably slower. The last official stop on the trip was the port of Odessa, first opened in 1794. Today, it's the focal point of the southern Ukrainian city of one million residents, located on the northwest shore of the Black Sea. Each year, the many terminals handle 21 million tons of dry cargo, 25 million tons of bulk cargo, and over a half million containers. Rail access on site allows for many ag commodities to reach the both new and old silo facilities, ferrous and non-ferrous metals, petroleum and vegetable oils, raw sugar and grains, perishables, and containers in a wide variety of sizes come and go 24 hours a day. The many farmers and agribusinesses that welcomed us to their operations had a common theme. Come and see us in 10 years and see how hopefully we have grown. Obviously there's a lot of challenges that the people have faced in the past that they've been through and it's easy to see why it's hard for them to trust people, especially the way the involvement is. And it'll be interesting to see how it changes as they're making these steps to progress into the future. Traveling over to the Ukraine has been a great experience. This is my first time over overseas, and you know I, I kind of got to see what people live like, you know, in other countries. You know, the poor from the poor to the to the rich. You know, they they all had their way of life that was quite a bit different than back home. They're a guarded people. I can t you know I I feel you know they've had different. Um, Countries come in and want to take over, you know, have more influence on their uh, economics and their industry and their farming. Um, however, you know, I think a lot of the farmers are very proud people. Everyone that we met was very uh, proud of, of their operation from the small to the large. There are many challenges ahead in regard to the future of agriculture in Ukraine. Storage capacity for grain is increasing, but at a very slow pace. Transportation via highway and rail is a challenge due to poor infrastructure. Biotechnology is currently illegal, restraining the ability on potential yields. An acquisition of equipment is a challenge due to interest rates on money at 27 percent. It would be interesting to learn more about it, how much they're using the rails and the rivers here. There seems to be the roads are spotty. There's areas where they're really good and areas where they're not so hot. You don't see a lot of on-farm storage, which is surprising that they haul so much to a, a big local elevator. Some of these large farms, you would think there would be more on-farm storage. We 
did talk with some large processors and some large commercial farming operations, and I gather from speaking with those people that bank credit uh, at a more uh, conventional rate is available uh, for, those, for those people. And speaking with um, some of the representatives, uh, government representatives here, uh, we found that uh, credit sources include Poland, Germany, uh, the UK, and, and possibly the Scandinavian countries, though I'm not sure about that latter. On the side of the state-run Ivan Honchar Museum in Kiev, there's the Before I Die Wall, where people write their fervent wishes, many in hope, of a better future. From what the tour participants saw over their seven days in country, Ukraine has the potential to prosper and grow.